Hi, this is Bruce Buffer, your voice of the Oxygen, and you're listening to MMA Mental. Welcome to this week's MMA Mental podcast, which is sponsored by UK Fightwear and the UFC Live Facebook page. You can follow UK Fightwear on Twitter at UKFW. Also follow ourselves on Twitter at MMA Mental. And you can like the UFC Live Facebook page. We've got about 35,000 likes, so it's a really, a really good page worth liking. Also, we've got uh, we've got three great guests lined up. But before we let you know about, about those guests, just want to shout out some of our uh, our fellow friends. We've got uh, other podcasts that we, we, do, we always like, to, uh, like for you to check out. We've got the MMA podcast, The Word on the Street, the MMA Roundtable, which is a collaboration of all the podcasts together. MMA Mental Roundtable, which is myself, uh, Ray, uh, Brooks Bailey, Brad Wharton, uh, and UFC middleweight Luke Barnett, where we break down the latest UFC card. You can see how, how good we are at predicting. And check out the following Facebook pages, the MMA Addiction, MMAMental.com, UFC Games, and of course, the UFC Live Facebook page. Okay, I've got three guests uh, lined up for this week. So we start off with uh, Khalid Ismail. He's currently 3-0. With all of his fights being in the in the UC MMA, and he's also the founder of the Lions Den Gym. Uh, guest number two is Angelica Chavez. She talks to us about her up and coming bout with Stephanie Skinner at XFC 25. And guest number three is Michael Mayday McDonald. He's one of the best bantamweights in the world. He talks about his road to the UFC, stealing someone else's UFC spot, and fights with uh, Miguel Torres, Hannah Brow, and um, also preparing for Brad Pickett. We are now joined by Khalid Desert Lion Ismail. Khalid uh, owns and trains out of the Lion's Den Gym. Khalid, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? Uh, very good. As I was just telling you before we started recording, we've actually had a, a request through from a listener uh, all the way from Morocco and it actually uh, requested that we get Khalid on the show because they wanted to hear him being interviewed. So so thank, thanks for coming on, Khalid. I really appreciate it. Okay, let, let, let's get a little bit of your background. Uh, you've, uh, I mean, you, you've been you've, you're three and zero currently in mixed martial arts. But even before you were fighting in mixed martial arts, you had a background in other type of martial arts. What other martial arts have you done? Um, I originally started. Uh, well, I started my martial arts career goes back quite a long, long way. Actually, I started when I was about five years old in uh, like at uh, Kyokushin Karate, um, my original style. So um, I done that for. Quite a few years. I took kickboxing after that. That was about uh, 17, 18. Um, then got into BJJ, um, wrestling. So I've been doing them for the last 13 years as well. So I got quite a. a um, I didn't actually feel comfortable competing in M- MMA until I actually understood each art that I was doing. So that's why I, I kind of started a bit late in my career. But I was competing in kickboxing for a long time. So after doing all the different arts and obviously competing in kickboxing, doing the, you know you talk about karate, wrestling, BJJ, was MMA like a natural progression for you? Is that what you were always aiming for? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I got into MMA uh, after I had a street, had a, had a fight on the street, um, and the guy, the guy, the guy fell on the floor, and I, 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 I kind of knocked him down. He fell on the floor, and he grabbed my top, and then I was like struggling to finish the fight, and I was like. Uh, and I got home and I watched some UFC and I, and I saw uh, Horace Gracie that time and he was submitting someone and I was thinking, oh, it, it's that guy knew a bit of BJJ, I've got to sort it So uh, it kind of like triggered something off in my mind, but I need to learn this ground fight. And then from there I wanted to learn the wrestling and, and it kind of progressed. And then because I've been doing it for such a long time, but because I train with such uh, high caliber guys, I always felt that we, we, I, need, I didn't understand the art completely to just to get into MMA. So I needed to learn and become like, almost, almost like, uh, obviously they don't do like grading in wrestling or anything like that. So I thought I need to get to a level where uh, I'm at least a brown belt, black belt, where I knew what was going on. I understood the art of wrestling, um, which we don't have a strong base in the UK. Um, so for me, then once I understood the art a little bit, then it was easy for me to think to myself, okay, now, now I'm ready, I can understand, I can compete in MMA. It's interesting you there that you you mentioned the wrestling because wrestling has definitely improved in the UK, but it's you know it's still fair to say that we're a long way behind, especially you know the North Americans. Where did you where did you train wrestling? Was that in the UK or did you travel overseas to do that? Um, I, I mean, I, I was quite fortunate. I got a, I got a brilliant um, wrestling coach from Bulgaria. Um, he's um, like an Olymp- um Kind of, kind of level. He, we we go back to Bulgaria. Train, I trained with the Olympic team out there in Bulgaria as well. 
Um, but I mean, put it so when I when I go there and I see like you, you, you they've got um, a hall which is probably about they've got six or ten. 10 metre by 10 metre Olympic mats covering this whole place and you have like 70, 80 guys, Olympic standard guys training and you see the level of wrestlers there and you think, oh, you, you, you understand the big, you understand the difference between the UK and, and, and countries like that and then you think, so if you need, you need to train these guys and understand and get, get that type of level. I mean, I was, I was wrestling with a guy who was 60 years old um, and this guy was on another level, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> and he's, a, he's, a, he's an Olympic coach. That's that's phenomenal. You're right. You're right. Wrestling is is such a huge part of mixed martial arts as well. And you, sometimes you've got to travel away to to train uh, with some of some of the best. Let's talk a little bit about your gym. You um you 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 are the the one of the obviously you run Lions Den Gym. I believe you're one of the founders of Lions Den Gym. Uh, how long have you been run, running the Lions Den Gym for? Uh, I opened uh, the Lions Den in two thousand and six. Um, the first branch and then uh, in 2010 I opened a, a second branch in Monford uh, the first one we opened was in Chadwell Heath um, in London um, and it all again it was all progression like mixed martial arts um, I, I was teaching uh, locally I had loads of clubs around and then I kind of needed a base where I need to train and teach everyone um, so it kind of like the idea came I was, I was heavily into uh, which is known now strength and conditioning what people was doing this type of stuff. I would just do weights and um, train with weights and stuff. But I had to go to specific gyms for this. And I had to go to uh, a specific gym for cardio work. And I wanted to put everything into one place. And that's that's how the idea came up about LDG, uh, the lines then. And we, we kind of got all the best um, facilities of everything. So if you was a bodybuilder or strength conditioner, you had everything in-house. You don't have to go to other gyms. Um, and again, we tried to offer like affordable packages as well. So it wasn't like, I, I mean, I, I used to pay over two, three hundred pounds a month um, just on training because um, I had to go mem have memberships in different gyms. And I didn't really want, I wanted to offer youngsters something affordable where they get everything included into the gym. Could you ever imagine when you set this up and when you started this that it would be as successful and, uh, as it has and grow the way it has? Um, I, to, to be honest, I don't, I don't like to say yes because it doesn't sound arrogant, but... Um, I kind of knew, because it was something that I needed myself as a fighter, and there was other guys around me, I knew that this was a place that where people would want to train and have everything. The only thing is that what, what we made sure that we did was um, had the best kind of facilities and stuff, and we, need, and we, need, we needed to uh, have everything on point. The training was on point, the trainers that we have, they were on point. Um, and we'd be quite fortunate enough to hit off straight away. Now you mentioned uh, earlier on in the interview that uh, you the training with some of you know with some of with some of the top guys. Can you can you name some of the people that you currently train with and who who train at the the Lions Den gym? Um, I have my boxing coach Terry Dunstan, who is for, former cruiserweight um, um, champion, British European um, Commonwealth champion, uh, Lubomir. Uh, he's a wrestling coach for Bulgaria Olympic and Olympic standard. I've got Nick Nick, Nick Brooks, uh, Roger Gracie, Black Belt. I've actually trained uh, um, Roger Gracie for he he fight, um, and he comes in as well. So he, he's he's part of the part of the LDG team as well. Um, I've got Galor Bafando, UC MMA fighter, UK uh, MMA UK one champion as well. So we got we got we got everyone who at the moment is competing. Um, so they're all active and they're all fighting as well. So um, good good level. <laughs> Now I know you're currently three and zero, and uh, all three of your fights have, have been in the UCMMA. What's it been like fighting for UCMMA? Um, I mean, I just got, I just got, uh, to be honest, I just got back from um, the UFC um, on the eighth uh, when Roger fought, and um, when, I, when I see you, Dave, I'll tell him to be honest, UCMMA, um, the actual show, because when, when I was trying to compare it to UFC. UFC obviously is a, is a much grander scale, but UCMMA definitely um, the, the setup, the organisation, the way that the way that the way they're running it is is actually brilliant. Um, I, I do I actually thought you know what um, yeah, they're not too far behind. It's it's only because it's um, not as big or we don't do things as big as, as stuff in America, but they're definitely on point. They're getting there, um, and it's a it's a brilliant platform. Um, I think 
if you fight on these MMA shows, you kind of understand. You won't feel out of out of touch if you went into the UFC. You'll actually understand. Oh, this is what I need to do, and and, and it's kind of a good level, a uh, good base to get into the UFC for fight for UK fighters as well. Yeah, you can tell UFC MMA is run very well. It's it's always been one of the the more con- the c- more consistent uh, promotions, uh, and we've seen some great fighters uh, come through the promotion as well. Uh, yeah, you, you you're currently three and zero. The la- your last time you fought was December two thousand twelve. Is uh, is there any plans for you to of when you're going to fight next? I'm fighting October the fifth. Um, so two thousand thirteen. So not 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 long to go now. I mean I'm in training at the moment. Um, I've been unfortunate with uh, a couple of injuries. Um, two, uh, I fought in December. That was my comeback from a year out because I tore my bicep. Um, then I was supposed to fight in April and I, and I fractured my wrist. Um, so I had to take a little time out. And then, um, so I'm back now in October. So but training's going great. Uh, feeling good, feeling strong. Um, and October 13th, ready to go. Oh, October 5th, sorry, ready to go. Do you know your opponent yet for October the 6th? Uh, not yet. Um, we've we've um, been given a couple of names, but um, we're still going to decide who, who, who we're going to take on. Um, to be honest, we've, this, I think this is probably the only issue with the UK MMA scene is that you get a lot of people pulling out um, and fighters changing. So I kind of will secure someone in the next week or so, but I uh, just need to make sure because they still, I find like if what I found was I was throwing a name a couple of days ago and uh, I was about to confirm it and I found out he just fought again yesterday and he lost. So for me, it's like, okay, this guy's not taking it seriously. You need to train properly for 10 weeks and dedicate yourself for a fight, not take fights every other week or something, and you're going to get injured halfway through. Yeah, that especially if you're fighting at the kind of level of UCMMA, you want somebody yeah, who's going to... I mean, yeah, that's, that, that, that's the only issue I have. I mean, if someone, if someone takes a fight with me, I would like, to, I'd like them to be professional about it and think to myself, you know what, they need, they need to not fight on other shows because um, it's happened to me loads of times halfway through. I, I mean, the, lot, the one in April was a complete mess because half six weeks I didn't have an opponent. And then um, then, uh, then after that, then they changed it. Then the guys agreed the fight, pulled out. Then they just got another guy in from Lithuania and stuff and it was just all over the place. Um, and to be honest, I don't like I don't like doing things like that. It's not about not fighting anyone. It's um, to do with, I think, pro- uh, professionalism on the other camp side as well to decide, you know what, if you're going to take a fight with someone, see it through 10 weeks or whatever you're going to do. Don't fight on other shows halfway through. No, I understand. I understand where you're coming from, especially with the risk of injury as well. Because if if he pulls out, that leaves you training uh, without an opponent, which you know, which obviously isn't fair. Because yeah. uh, to be honest, like, I, I, I I kind of like sympathise with a lot of fighters because a lot of guys spend a lot of money on training for with trainers and going abroad and stuff like. That. And this is this is what happened. The last fight like, we we went to Bulgaria for a camp. We trained in, I was training in Bulgaria, so I had hotel expenses and uh, food and everything uh, abroad and stuff. And then when you get back and the guy's pulled out, and you, okay, then you have to change change a complete game to, to suit someone else, and it's um, it's a lot of money that you're spending out. Um, and again, not just me, I think fighters in general, and and it's and I find it like that's the only downside with the British MMA kind of scene, where where guys should if they're going to take a fight, they need to, to make sure the teams need to make sure that they, these guys need to be on point. Right, you're not going to fight other shows, you're going to do this, and we're going to get you there in 10 weeks ready for this fight because I mean because um, I also coach that's what I do with my fighters if they take a fight it's basically right you're training for this for that fight you're not going to do any other shows to prepare for that fight you're doing this fight and you're going to prepare properly for that fight and I, I think that's I think that's fair enough will your fight uh, will you still be fighting at welterweight I'll be fighting at welterweight yeah that's right well, uh, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. It's always nice when we get a listener request an interview. It's always nice to be able to get that interview. So thank you for agreeing to come on to today's show. No problem. Welcome. Before we let you go, I should give you a chance to do any shout-outs. Do you want to thank anybody, any sponsors, and let people know about your Facebook and your, and your Twitter as well? Yeah, um, you can follow me on um, Hallismal, LDG, Facebook and Twitter. Um, and we'll shout-out everyone at Team LDG, LDG Fitness Centre. Um, thank you for supporting all the guys in uh, Morocco, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, all over the UK, um, people in America. Um, thank you for supporting, following. And uh, October 5th, we're going to have uh, tickets out 
to come to Paul and uh, it's going to be it's going to be exciting. <laughs> Okay, we're now joined by Angelica Chavez. Angelica will be, fa- uh, will be fighting Stephanie Skinner on XFC 25. Angelica, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Uh, my, my pleasure. Obviously, I, I do want to talk about, about the fight uh, that you've got coming up. Before I do that, I want to, uh, want to get a little bit of your background. Uh, you've been fighting in, uh, professionally in mixed martial arts since 2009. What got you into mixed martial arts? Uh, well, my parents, they own a karate school, and the style that they teach, it's called Kaju Kimbo. And in and of itself, it is a mixed martial arts. And so I've kind of grown up doing the whole all-around stand-up ground, everything all the way around in the Kaju Kimbo. And so um, we went to some fights and saw some girls that were fighting around my weight class and kind of just decided we could we could do that and just decided to jump into it. And was it an easy transition for you to make from training to competing? Was it was it something that you just wanted to do straight away once you tried it? Yeah, it it was an easy, um, in a sense, crossover. I honestly don't even feel like it was a crossover, just because my whole life um, we've trained. I've trained the Kaji Kimbo, and and it really is in and of itself its own mixed martial arts. And so uh, it was just a little different to be in a cage um, as a at a pro level. That was my, I didn't do any amateur MMA, and so we just jumped into the pro. So it was a little bit different to do that, but really I didn't, I didn't feel like it was something new. Have you had to change your training up much, or are you pretty much sticking with, with what, with what brought you to the table, as, as they say? Um, I guess, you know, we've gotten a little more specific with, with things, you know, such as the wrestling and the jiu-jitsu. But overall, it's it's really the same the same basics that I grew up with. Now you started uh, your professional career. I mean, you you went you went four and out. You you would you picked up your, your you know four four wins. Um, and one of the things that jumps out to me as well is that you every fight you've won, uh, you've won with a submission. So do you feel that that is your strength? That you, the ground game is what you is what you prefer. No, not not necessarily. Um, I feel like I'm really well rounded. Uh, I'm comfortable anywhere. It's just that I've been able to showcase uh, my submission skills, and so um, I definitely, in future fights, want to showcase a little bit more of my stand up. Uh, but really, I feel like I'm a really well rounded fighter. I'm comfortable anywhere. Now, before we talk about the the fight, I just want to get your your take on women's uh, women's mixed martial arts in general. I think it's fair to say we've seen a, a real boom uh, in women's mixed martial arts with with what Invicta FC are, do, are doing, uh, are doing sorry, what XFC are doing, what UFC are doing. What's your thoughts on the growth of uh, women's mixed martial arts and how exciting is it to be part of it? I think it's amazing and it's fantastic um, the growth in the sport in this last really in this last year or two, um, and I think it's just going to get bigger and better there's a lot more talent out there and when I first started back in 2009 when I went pro it was kind of hard to well actually like my first fight was wasn't even at 105 because we couldn't find any girls at that size they were hard to come by and so now um, each division is growing and just a lot more talent coming through and so I just think women's MMA in the next year or so is really just going to accelerate and it's going to be great. Now, I'm, 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 hopefully I'm right here, but I believe this is XFC's first 105 fight. Is that correct? Yes. So yes, how sir. how exciting is it that the XFC are putting on uh, a 105 division, and you get you get the chance to showcase that you're one of the first people to showcase that division for the XFC? How exciting is that? Super exciting. It's definitely an honor to be you know the first 105er in that XFC cage, um, and I guarantee we're going to put on a great show. And I'm sure it will open up more opportunities for other 105ers to fight in the in the division because, you know, I believe not just because I'm a small fighter, but I believe the small fighters are really the most entertaining fights. They're so fast, so agile. Um, it's just a different aspect aspect to the game. And so, yeah, I'm definitely excited to be the first 105er in that cage. Now, it's been a, a 12 months since your last professional fight. Has there been a reason for the layoff? No, um, I was supposed to fight um, Miss Skinner in April and had some 
some injuries coming during training, and so um, we pulled out of that fight and, you know, healed up and everything, and now we're ready for this one. But other than that, it's just been nothing specific, just been training still the whole time in the gym, um, nothing specific, just just waiting for time is right. Now, this, of course, is going to be also be, as well as it being the 105 debut for XFC, it's going to be your debut as well. Uh, the fight's going to be on, yes. on national television. How, how, what, what does it feel like to be part of X, a part of that and knowing that your fight's going to be televised? How, what's that done for your career? Um, it's exciting, definitely. I don't, I don't feel added pressure because every fight is the same, you know, whether there's TV or there's not, or you're in a small town fighting in a tiny cage with nobody there. Every time that you fight, it's it's a it's a war, you know. And so I feel I don't feel that I'm having added pressure, but I definitely am honored to be on the XFC card and the featured bout on TV. I definitely think that that's a great opportunity, and I'm gonna definitely take advantage of it. Now you're facing uh, Steph Skinner, uh, which she's obviously a very very tough opponent. What are your thoughts on uh, Steph Skinner as an opponent? Um, well, nothing specific. I know she comes from a great camp. Um, she has some great training partners, great coaches, and so I'm definitely expecting, um, a real tough fight. I'm expecting a war. But, um, I don't have anything specific on, on her. She's real, she's well-rounded as well, you know. I think she's won some fights. TKO, a lot of ground and pound. Um, she's well-rounded, and so I'm, I'm ready for anything for this fight. Sorry, who are some of the people that have helped you prepare for this fight? Some of your training partners uh, and the gym and the coaches that have helped you get ready? Uh, well, my dad is my head coach, Grandmaster Chavez, and um, Coach Manny Garcia. I have a wrestling coach, and those are really my main coaches that help me prepare. And then I have a great um, a great team behind me, and so it's really a, a group effort. And everyone, everyone comes in every day, and they motivate me and our sparring partners and running partners, and so all the way around, I just come from a great team. Well, I know we're, we're a few, about about four odd weeks out from the fight, so it's I really appreciate you giving me the time so close to, obviously, while you're in your training camp, so close to the fight. It's been a real pleasure having you on, to, on to today's show. No problem. Thank you for having me. Uh, before we let you go, I just want to give you a chance to do any shout-outs. you want to uh, shout-out any friends, family, sponsors, and let people know about your Facebook and your Twitter as well? Uh, Trim Nutrition, they're my main sponsor. I really appreciate everything they do. And just Travis Dojo, thank you for everything. And uh, can, can the fans follow you on Facebook and Twitter? Uh, my Twitter is A Chavez MMA. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's been a real pleasure having you on today's show. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Okay, I'm now joined by Michael Mayday McDonald. Uh, Michael is currently 15-2 and two and he's got a big fight coming up in a couple of weeks facing uh, Brad Pickett here in Boston. Michael, thank you for joining us today. No, no problem, man. Thank you. Okay, obviously I do want to talk about the fight with, with Brad Pickett. It's going to be an absolutely super fight. You're two of the, the top bantamweights uh, in the world. But before we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about, about your background. Uh, you started fighting professionally in 2007. How long, uh, how long have you been training in mixed martial arts? Well, I started training uh, mixed martial arts when I was, I think, uh, 11 or 12. Uh, so I moved to uh, a, a new gym when I was 13, and I started fighting amateur at 14. Now, you, you've, all, you've been considered as one of the new breed of fighter, so somebody that's not necessarily come from a specific MMA, uh, a specific martial art background, but has come in and trained all of mixed martial arts. Would you say that was, was that, is that fair to say? Uh, I'd say it's pretty fair to say. Um, I, I still always favor my striking a little bit more. Um, it's a special feeling when you knock someone out. It, it's kind of, it, you can't really compare it to submissions or, you know, TKOs or anything like that. That's probably always going to be my favorite. But um, I think I only have about, what, maybe maybe six more months in kickboxing than I do in jiu-jitsu. Um, so kickboxing and jiu-jitsu were my main bases, and then I started doing wrestling um actually i didn't start doing my wrestling until i was about 16 years old 
Um, so I have a significant amount more um, in kickboxing and jiu-jitsu. But uh, I, I feel right now, I feel like they're all very, very highly up to par. And I think we, we see that uh, definitely when you fight. Now, you put on a hell of a run, uh, and then you were picked up by Zufa, and, and you made your debut at WEC 52. How did it come about that you were approached by Zufa? Well, um, my first real big fight, you know, uh, my biggest competition, you know, jump up in competition, um, I was 18 years old, and I was fighting Cole Escovito uh, for the first time. Cole Escovito was the uh, first 145-pound champion for the WEC Fought Uriah Faber, Jim Pulver. Uh, he fought all these really uh, experienced fighters all around the world. And uh, Cole had, I think, it was a staff infection that almost made him paralyzed. And he, had, I was his comeback fight when I was 16 or uh, 18. I'm sorry. Um, and when I was 18, he beat me. That was my first loss. And after that, he went to go to Japan. He he, he got all these places. Uh, he was Tachi Palace champion, and and he. He was actually the one who caught Zufa's eye, um, and he was actually defending his title against me. It, it was my rematch against him. He beat me the first time, and now I get to fight him again, and Cole Escobedo was already the champion. And Zufa was there to scout Cole back to the WEC, because he was the WEC champion before Uriah. And actually, um, Reed Harris was there watching the fight, and uh, you know everyone's like, hey, why are you here? And he's like, oh, I'm here to take Cole back to the to the WEC, and um, I knocked Cole out in the second round. And he goes, well, I guess, uh, I guess I'll go talk to this guy instead. And uh, he uh, came up to my parents after the, after the fight and he gave them the, their card. Or he actually came up to my older brother, I'm sorry, and gave him uh, his card. And um, then I ran into him, and he said, you know, you did an awesome job, and uh, we would love to have you over at the WEC. It was just kind of a spur of the moment, just uh, – kind of jumped on Cole's coattails and uh, took his opportunity. <laughs> that's that's crazy. So what, you missed what? You were 19 at that, that time? Uh, yes, at that time when I had my rematch with him, uh, I got the, I knocked him out in the second round. I got the Tachi Palace Phantomweight Championship uh, title and I got picked up by the WC all at 19. That's one half. What was that? Sorry, that's a, that's one hell of a night. Did you know that they were there, or didn't you know till after the fight? Um, I, I think I might have heard rumors that you know they were they were planning on scouting them back to the WEC and stuff, but uh, it wasn't too much. I, I think I think uh, my manager at the time he was like, "Hey, that guy over there is uh, he's from the WEC. That's the guy you need to impress." I'm like, oh, cool, you know. <laughs> so we all knew he was there, but uh, you know. It was just all speculation. We just, we, everyone was just crazy. That, like a crazy happened that he was just in the building. You know, we were all like trying to kiss up to him and stuff like that. You know. <laughs> now, uh, you obviously you made your WEC, WEC debut against uh, Clint Godfrey. You still at this stage, really, really young, making this debut. Did you feel any extra pressure, or was it just another night at the office for you? Um, you said my debut in the WEC. Yeah, when you made your debut against Clint Godfrey, because you were stepping up to the WEC and you, it was under Zufa, did you feel any extra extra pressure, or was it just another night at the office? Um, no, I, I think it was just another night in the office. I, I feel like, in general, I've usually been pretty good at um, keeping my mind grounded when it comes to, you know, uh, a new organization, you know, bigger opponents or whatever. It's always been a step up in competition. Um, my, my whole career, I've only had two fights where... I've actually taken a, a slight step down in competition. That's been right after my losses, um, fighting the champion of your organization and then, you know, getting knocked down. Both times I, 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 I fought, you know, the champions the first time I lost. And my next fight was um, with, with someone a little bit uh, further down on the ranking system, just like this one is going to be, um, aside from Pin and Burrell. Um But for the, for the most part, I, I in my career, I've been able to, I think I've been able to stay grounded, and you know, it's, it's just another fight. It doesn't matter how many people are here, how many people are watching, or it, it's just always another step up the ladder, and it's always fighting tougher competition. Um, you know, it's very rare that you can ever say I've been here before, because you're always fighting someone better than you did the last time, um, if you're winning. You know, so uh, 
I, I think in my career I've done a really good job on that for the most part, actually until my last fight. Um, but, and, and it wasn't even because I was fighting for the title. Um, I, I, I felt like I felt a little bit of a, a little bit of the pressure of the world, you know, like all the eyes looking at me. It wasn't so much about the fight as the opponent. Um, I feel like that, that gave me a, a little bit of a, a rough time, uh, but I feel like afterwards I was able to, uh, get, you know, recentered and, um, refocused. Yeah, well, obviously we'll, we'll move on. We'll, we'll, we will talk about that fight, but before we do, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, obviously, not long after you'd, you'd fought for the WEC, uh, it was announced that the UFC were going to integrate the WEC featherweight and bantamweight divisions. How excited were you when you heard that news? <laughs> well, I didn't exactly know that I was going to go to the WEC. Um, I had two offers on the table when I beat Cole DeVito um, and got the Tachi Palace title. Um, one offer was from Dream, and the other offer was from the WEC. Um, the one from the WEC was actually for less money. Um, the, the, the one for the dream was actually for more money. And we were going back and forth of what do I want to do, um, you know, which place do I want to go to fight and stuff like that. And, um, you know, due to dreams, um, I guess you could say due to dreams, controversy with not being able to pay some fighters. Um, I, I know some fighters who fought for them and hadn't been paid we decided to go with the uh, the safe route and go with the WEC. Um, and because it's an American fight organization, um, I, I like I like what, the, what they do and their connection with the UFC. So I, I figured that that was a uh, we as a team figured out that, that was a better avenue to go. And when you know I, I was at the, the gym training my strength and conditioning, and my manager called me and he says, "Congratulations." You're uh, you're in the UFC, and I was like, "What? That's awesome!" And, and, and he said, uh, "I bet that uh, that decision we made not to go to Japan really sounds good right about now, huh?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's a good idea." <laughs> that's crazy. Imagine if you'd have gone to Japan and then you'd have heard that exactly. the announcement. You'd have been absolutely gutted, wouldn't you? Now you made your UFC debut against uh, Edwin Figueroa. Now it's fair to say you've pretty much had every every fight you've had in the UFC has, has been against a tough opponent. What was it like making your UFC debut against Edwin Figueroa? Um, my fight with Edwin Figueroa, you know, it was my first fight in the UFC, and um, you know, I don't really think there's so much of a difference. Uh, like I said before, it's not too much the different um, different experience or different feeling no matter who I'm fighting or, or exactly on the venue um, of, of the actual fight, the fight feeling is the same no matter where you go. Um, it's just a fight, and, and, and fights always feel the same. So on, on my actual fight career, it doesn't stick out to me as something that's like, uh, you know, a big thing or something that uh, you know, has like, uh, you know, I look at it as special. Um, as a life experience, it was cool, though, um, you know, I, I came in there and I got, for the first time, I, I got a baggie full of goodies, you know, UFC clothes, and um, I had a few more people ask for my autographs and the cameras, and I, I had to do uh, body scans for video games, um, a lot of photo shoots, a lot of interviews, and that part was kind of cool as a life experience, you know, to, uh, you know, one, one day I'm going to be old and I can talk to my grandkids about that, and, uh, that that was a cool thing to, to go from really nothing to just overwhelming, just attention and exposure, you know, due to the huge jump. Um, so so I, I say it's a good, it's a cool life experience, but on, on the actual like fight, um, like the journey of my fighting, it, it my fight with Edwin Figueroa doesn't stick out at all. There's there's always special circumstances that oh I might have screwed up on this, you know, like I I I, I, um, I screwed up on my my rehydration with Edwin Figueroa, I gained weight. I, I screwed up on my uh, rehydration, so I was incredibly dehydrated. So that sucks, you know, and there's always certain circumstances, you know, coming into each fight with different problems, but that's all I can say about that. Now, uh, you also fought on UFC 139 against Alex Soto. Now, UFC 139, yeah. I think it's fair to say, was as it was considered as one of the the best cards ever. What was it like being part of that card, and what was the buzz like uh, behind the scenes after the event? <laughs> you, you know, uh, aside, aside from, um, 
you know, being on the greatest, you know, supposedly, no, one of the greatest events in MMA history, um, it, it was pretty, I guess you could say, nerve-wracking, the fact that I just got a knockout, and now I have to watch, watch people like Kung Lee and Van, 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 Van Lee Silva and Kung Lee and, and all these, like, you know, heavy hitters, and Dan Henderson and Shogun Hua, you know, possibly take my, my knockout of the night bonus. That was scary is what it was. Um, not, you know, having all these just, just beasts of a fighter on, on the card after me and hoping that nobody gets knocked out better than mine was. So that was, uh, when I think about, when I think about that fight, that's what I think of. Yeah, that's, I can see where you're coming from. That's, that's pretty cool. I mean, that was, it, that, the, the card was just epic from top to bottom. It was an epic card. Now, I think your next fight, uh, I think I, I think it was a landscape fight. It really kind of put you out at the front. You faced uh, Miguel Torres, who of course has got a huge reputation, and you didn't just beat him, but I mean you knocked him out cold. Uh, how did you feel going yeah. into that fight, and what was it like getting the win? Uh, the way you got the win. Um, can you ask me that question one more time? I'm sorry, you cut out for just a second. How did you feel going into that fight, and what was it like getting not just getting the win, but getting it in such devastating fashion? Man, it, 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 it really did feel good. Um, it, it felt good to showcase my skills for the first time in front of the UFC. I, I felt like I, uh, I, I kind of got, um, I didn't really get to showcase my skills the right way in my fight with Chris Carriasso and with Edwin, Edwin Figueroa. Those, those are my first decisions that I've ever went to in my, in my career. Um, before that, I, you know, I had all of my fights, they were, they were finishes. I had seven um, first-round knockouts and submissions in a row. And then after that, you know, I had one loss, and I went back to knocking everybody out in the, in, in the first and one in the second round. And I felt just so disappointed going in and getting two decisions for my first UFC fight and getting that, that knockout against Alex Soto just felt so good and felt it felt right. Because that's, that's what... Um, that's what got me into the UFC. That's what got me my wins. That's what I pride my myself off on on my career and my finishing ability. And to just show that in front of everybody, it was just uh, it was awesome. Now, of course, your next fight after that was uh, was in the UK. I was there for this fight. Uh, you were fighting for the for the bantamweight in, interim title. What was it like fighting in the UK and headlining your first event? Sorry, say that one more time. What was it like fighting in the UK, and what was it like headlining your first UFC event? <laughs> um, well, like, like I said earlier, there's, there's different challenges with every um, with every fight. I mean, with, there's different injuries. There's you know with different places. Um, there's always different challenges, um, but the fight was exactly the same as it always has been. Um, it's just another fight and another place, and. The actual fight doesn't stick out as something that was uh, an obstacle or anything like that, really. Um, what really sticks out, for one, was um, with the flight. Um, I, I had a really hard time um, with the jet lag, and that was actually screwed me up. I didn't get adjusted the entire time. Like, I woke up from a two-hour nap and then left to go fight is, is basically what happened. I, I didn't get adjusted at all. Um, I, I, was, I was sick. Uh, I had the flu that week, the week of the fight. Um, I, 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 I was having a lot of injuries in my leg, and that's why I didn't throw any kicks. So there was a lot of really random things. It was just a bad day, um, bad day to fight. And not only that, it, it was just, um, I felt like, I guess you could say, I, I felt like uh, I let my feet get a little off the ground. Um, I, I wasn't as grounded in that one in my, in my heart and in my mind, uh, I think, where I should have been, um, you know, with all the people looking at me. I feel like it's a... Kind of captivated me just a little bit too much, and I was worried about people, what people were, were thinking about, what I was going to say to people. You know, I did way too many interviews, and I was okay with it. You know, I, I did like I, I did like twice as many as were, were required, just because people asked me to. And I was like, ah, sure, why not? I'm bored. You know, and it, it, it turned turned into people what what people saw instead of dude, just get back to your freaking room and <laughs> go rest, and, and, and it's about the fight. You know. Um, so I feel like there were things like that, which which kind of screwed it up. Um, but actually, going to England was really cool. Like I said, it's a life experience. That's nothing to do with my fight. Fighting, it sucked. It was a bad day. But it's a life experience. You know, when all this is done, 
you know, I'm, I'm going to have stories to talk to my kids about, my grandkids, and it was definitely cool to get the feel of just another country. Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we talk about uh, the fight with, with Brad Pickett, you've mentioned there a few times about experiences, but not necessarily being fights that stood out to you. Uh, so which fights have stood out to you? Which have been your some of your favorite fights so far in your young career? Did you say have, have been some of my toughest fights? Or, or some, of your, some of your favorite fights. Some of your fights that you look back and they, they stand out to you as some of your own personal highlights early on in your career. My favorite fights are the ones where I go and I deliver the way that I know I can. Um, the, I think every fighter needs to have the um, it, almost a, a confidence that, it, that is um, almost unreal. It, 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 you have to have a confidence that um, you are the best fighter in the world and that you can beat everyone in the world. Whether you can or you can't, you need that confidence. And... Um, I think mine is backed by proper logic. I really do think that I can. Um, I don't think I'm dumb. Um, I, I think that it's accurate um, if the conditions are right. Um, and my favorite fights are always those where I have something playing in my head and it actually comes to pass, like the Miguel Torres fight. Um, I, 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 I wanted to come in there. I wanted to bully him. I, I wanted to take control of that fight immediately and show him, hey, this is my cage, you know. I, I wanted to uh, use my use my power. Um, I wanted to use my evasion and frustrate him while him not being able to hit me while me landing big shots. You know, that was that was probably my favorite fight that I've ever had. Um, and I've had a few, um, few of my my young, younger part of my career that were, you know, very close to me as well. The Colas Cavito too was um, probably my favorite. Um, Colas Cavito too, Manny Tapia. Um, those are ones that are special, but I don't think anyone comes close to just Colas Cavito too. Right, okay, so moving on then. You've got a big fight coming in in a couple of weeks. You're going to be facing uh, the UK's Brad Pickett. It's fair to say that you two are, you know, are two, of the best, uh, two of the best bantamweights, you know, not just well, in the world. I mean, you are two of the top guys around at the moment. So what are your thoughts on Brad Pickett as an opponent? I think he's very well rounded. Um, you know, this, this is a fight um, where I, I'm not thinking, "Oh, I, I'm just going to be doing, you know, one dimension or something." This is a fight where I'm really going to come in and I'm going to try to, um, for lack of a better term, unlock the everything box. Um, just everything and anything that I want to do, just to do it whenever I feel like I, it, it's the right time. Um, um, I, I am fully expecting to, to throw a bunch of kicks and. To, to, to take him down and to defend takedowns. I, I'm expecting him to shoot in on me. Um, I'm, I'm expecting for me to get hit. I'm expecting to hit him back. Um, I, I'm expecting um, this fight to go really everywhere. And uh, I, I think he's a very well-rounded opponent. And you know, Just like when he fought Demetrius Johnson, I, I feel like Brad Pickett's the kind of person you need to fight well-rounded to win. It seems like once Demetrius Johnson was... Um, when he fought Brad Pickett, once he started you know, focusing more on the hands, and it turned into more of a boxing match. Brad Pickett turned, in, turned it into an MMA match and, you know, ultimately carried out the victory because of that. I, I, I feel like this is going to be a full mixed martial arts match. Coming off the first fight over Hen and Brow, do you feel that this is a good opponent to get yourself back in the mix? What was that? Obviously, coming off your loss against Hen and Brow, do you feel that this is a good opponent to get yourself back in the mix at the top end of the division? Um, I don't exactly see it that way. Um, it's not that oh, it's, it's an opponent that's good to get me back in after my last one or something like that. Um, to me, it's always about performing the way that I know that I can. Um, the only thing I can say about going from Hen and Brow to Brad Pickett um, I, I, is that I think this is one of those rare cases in my career where it's a step down in competition. And I'm not saying anything about Brad Pickett because right now I believe Hen and Brow is the best in the world. Um, so anyone aside from him after I just fought him is going to be a step down. Um, but I think it's still going to be a, a hefty task to fight him. I think he's going to be a great opponent. Um, to, to me, it's just about looking at, at styles and knowing what I can do, and um, I, I want exciting fights, and Brad Pickett's an exciting fighter. Um, 
you know, above, above all, above winning, above the title, above anything else. I want people to remember when I was on a fight card, when they think about you know, UFC on Fox Sports 1, I want them to remember Michael McDonald was on that card. When they think about UFC 139, I want them to think about, dude, Michael McDonald got the knockout of the night or one of the best MMA cards in the world that day. You know, Those are the things that I want people to remember. And I think that uh, this fight has, I guess you could say, it, it, it just has the, it has the taste for it. it, it this has a perfect setup to uh, make that happen. It certainly does. It's going to be, the whole card, to be honest with you, is absolutely stacked. It's going to be a fantastic card. I really appreciate you giving me your time today. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show. I've wanted to speak to you for quite a while. So thank you very much for your time. No problem at all. And before we let you go, I just want to give you a chance to do any shout-outs. you want to shout-out any friends, family, sponsors, and let people know about your Facebook and your Twitter? Of course, of course. Um First off, everybody you know, can follow me on, on Facebook at Mayday McDonald, and same uh, for Twitter at Mayday McDonald. But also, um, my fiance Rachel, she's uh, she's taken a lot of responsibility and just jumped in head first and has done a great job and uh, being my support system and, and my partner in this business. And uh, I think out of it, anybody else who I who I, I need to thank, it, it needs to be her for all of her support and my manager Tom Call, my team. Uh, the last time fight team, um, my great sponsors, Training Mass, The Throne, and Nanotech. Um, just it, it, it's a it's a team effort for for me to just get in and fight in a cage. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for being on today's show. All right, no problem. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this week's show. That was uh, that was our free guest. Hope you liked the interviews. As always, I'll be back again next week. Not quite sure who I've got lined up yet, but I'll, I'm sure I'll be able to sort something out. And thank you very much for listening.